cities. And as Martin pointed out, um, I'm working from a lovely Munich in Germany, uh, but the headquarters of OAC are in Brussels, Belgium. And um, we have today a round table uh, with three lovely participants. Um, unfortunately, our fourth speaker um, fell ill, but nevertheless, um, I think we will have really good discussions. Um, to introduce who's there today, we have uh, Mieke van Schaik. I tried to pronounce it as correctly yeah. as I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mieke is working um, for the city of Eindhoven as advisor to the CIO office. And uh, there she's mainly um, responsible for smart society, safety, public space, and also the smart strategy of Eindhoven. So it's really great to have you here, Mieke. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more what's happening in, in Eindhoven in relation to personal data management and sharing. How are you dealing with that? Yes. So you can just quickly say hi that everybody sees you. <laughs> hi, Mieke. Thank you. Thanks, Mieke. And then we have with us today Martin Brinsko. Uh, he is the chair of Open Natural Smart Cities and um, in his uh, normal life, um, associate professor at Aarhus University, uh, where he heads also the Center for Digital Transformation um, of Cities and Communities, uh, in short, DITCOM, and also the Aarhus University Smart Cities um, section, if I correct that right. And also, um, you are a man with many hats. Uh, you're mainly a lot involved in standardization uh, internationally, but also nationally. And just to pick one, uh, the ongoing work uh, with the Danish Standards Committee on Smart Cities and Community that you're also chairing. Um, Martin, maybe also quickly say hi to the round so that everybody knows who you are. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Martin, for being with us. And last but not least, we have Hanna niemi uh, She is the director of Tieke. And uh, Tieke, for those who don't know, is uh, the Finnish Information Society Development Center, if I translated that correctly into English. Um, and the Tieke is basically there to support society to make the most out of digitalization and also new technologies that are coming about. Um, and in this regard, I think um, when we're talking about capacity and skills uh, and the whole discussion around personal data and my data, um, this is quite critical. Um, so thanks for being here with us today, Hanna. And as we also mentioned before, you have some history uh, with the city of Helsinki, um, also as the director there. Um, yeah, director, I think, sorry, I'm just mixing things up probably. But you worked uh, with Forum Media in Helsinki for a long time and uh, closely worked also with the city on that side. So welcome to. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here. And uh, welcome also to those who just joined us in the meantime. Uh, pleasure to have you there and to seeing so much interest also in this uh, breakout session of um, the My Data Global Conference. We're really happy to be here and uh, to have this discussion about what is the role of personal data um, when we're talking about city management and communities and also regional management? Unfortunately, we don't have the speaker today who was talking from a regional point of view, but uh, Mika will have to cover that too. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so we will a bit more focus on, on the city perspective today um, than originally planned, uh, but I don't think that'll be an issue. And um, for all uh, the participants that are here today, I just want to say that um, if you have a question, if you would like to dive deeper, you can um, either raise your hand and maybe we take it on the go, depending on the flow of the conversation, or you can also just post your question or your comment also in the chat and we will take it up there um, towards a later stage uh, of uh, the meeting. So um, please feel free to, to drop in um, and, and participate in the communication and in the debate as well. Um, all right, uh, I think that's it for the introduction. Um, now let's get to the content, I would say. <laughs> and um, I'd like to start with a, with a first question, um, just to get the discussion a bit started. Uh, and that is, how do you think, and this question specifically actually goes to Mika, uh, because you're working for the city of Eindhoven. How do you think that um, public service provision will look like in the future? 
It's a very broad question to yes. get you going. Now, I really uh, surface uh, way of working because now we have to go to uh, department and department to get our documents and to get our services, uh, tell every time uh, who we are, what we need and explain it uh, several times. And in the future, um, we think that it's all serviced so that you get your documents be digital uh, before you have to ask uh, for them. So really uh, get the yeah things done before you even mentioned I have to uh, I have to arrange it. So full services. That's what we think, and that the cooperation between the departments are so easily that you are really serviced uh, and advised as that you wish, and that you are not uh, have to look where I have to go to, what do I have to do. So that's uh, our point of view where we are working for. And I, I know that you're having quite some projects uh, to make this basically a reality. Um, what is, can you tell us a bit more about one or two of these projects? Uh, that would be... Yeah, we are, uh, one of our projects are uh, the citizens cards for our citizens uh, who want to go for sport or to the theater. They have their own uh, uh, citizens card and the citizens card is also an app as a uh, physic uh, card, uh, because not everyone has a mobile phone so that they don't have an app. So for the uh, includes, uh, for all the people that they can uh, use all the services, uh, we are uh, developing uh, this. And the, the data is uh, all in hand by the citizens. So they can uh, collect about uh, their uh, interest, what they want to go for, and that they want to look for what's uh, interesting for me to do or to see, so that they can uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, swipe on the app or uh, more or less like uh, the tender uh, app uh, we always uh, set that you uh, collect your service, what you want and what you need uh, uh, for. And if you uh, want to uh, sport before, uh, even with a buddy, that you are looking for a buddy. And when you think, oh no, I'm not uh, any uh, sporter anymore, then you can clean up your totally device uh, so that you can see start all over again, so that you are really forgotten what uh, you uh, asked and serves before. This, that's one of the, the, the parts and we uh, think that um, uh, as a government we support some people for to go to sport or to do some things and when they are not able to pay it for themselves and we think from uh, from our municipality it's uh, good to have all the youth uh, young people uh, have going to sports then we can give them free tickets so that they can sport also and that it's not seen if they have paid it by themselves or that it's uh, serviced by the municipality. So that's also that they have more and less the same level of living and they are not ashamed about uh, the credits they receive from the municipality. So that's that's more and less uh, a way of working who, what, what we now are uh, developing, but it's hard work with uh, our GDPR, our privacy and security, um, what do uh, private partners with it? So that's uh, our, um, yeah, totally, uh, yeah, looking for how we can how we can manage it and arrange it. Yeah, it's actually something um, that I was also going to to ask later about uh, the 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 challenges that you're encountering. Um, there's also one question that uh, from from the participants that maybe relates to that. Um, and there's a question from Neil who asks, who has access to a person's citizen card? Maybe uh, you can yeah, we, detail there. <laughs> we start with a very small group of uh, sporters from our municipality, uh, where we uh, start uh, testing this, uh, this um, 
case with, and also with uh, the employees of the high tech campus we mentioned. The high tech campus is our uh, 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 part in the municipality with a lot of expats, and the expats uh, they. Um, it's not easy for them to get access to the Dutch uh, theaters, uh, sport communities. So we, we want to, to look for if we can make a, a community of the, the experts and the sports and if they can cooperate uh, uh, with each other. So that's what we are trying to do on the platform. And we know that we are uh, on the level of digitalization then we have to go to the information and then to the platforms so we have uh, uh, several steps of transformation uh, to make and we are starting very small as a citizen's card with uh, a very um, yeah with a lot of impact from the municipality so we are looking what's what's uh, the development, how do we arrange it, uh, how do we fix the data, uh, where do we uh, share the data, and which data. What, uh, what, it's not really the data that we want to share, but the information that is what we want to share. I cannot maybe, hear you. <laughs> sorry. Um, maybe just to, to build on what you just said as well, um, going to, to Hanna, um, what do you think? I mean, Miki already explained that uh, the personal data and also enabling uh, citizens will play an ever bigger role in, in, in the city's activities. Um, how do you see what role will, will personal data play in, in the smart cities? Um, well, actually, in the very near future already. Well, I think this was a very good example from Eindhoven that how you can kind of uh, be more uh, proactive as a city or predictive even that you can kind of offer uh, certain services uh, more personal in a more personalized manner to the groups that you as a city see that would benefit from, from those services. So I guess this kind of prediction, personalization, and then of course, thinking of the city budget also optimization so that you, it's usually in healthcare, for example, it's, it's quite a small group that create uh, the majority of the costs in, in the healthcare. So how could we kind of bring more personalized, uh, predictive uh, service delivery to those those people who really need it and could benefit from it? Uh, I, I think also uh, personal data, uh, we will start, especially if we look at this behavior change or nudging behavior. Uh, here was uh, talk about like sports and in, in that sense health, but of course we all the cities have uh, faced uh, the uh, climate mitigation uh, activities and needs, so they have quite big and ambitious climate um, or emission cut targets. So we would kind of need to get everybody on board on that. So I think that's something that where, where personal data can really help us to analyze whether it's about our mobility or energy consumption or even retail. Uh, we have very good examples from the biggest uh, Finnish retail chains who have kind of opened up this uh, uh, consumption, uh, con your uh, your consumption uh, data, and, and build a, a CO2 calculator on top of that, so you can actually learn like how can I change my behavior, my shopping uh, behavior, and and, and, con and consumption, so that it's more uh, climate friendly. But at the same time, the same tool offers, of course, uh, you to analyze: are, am I consuming salt too much, for example? So there's similar solutions can uh, drive a lot of uh, positive uh, behavior change, I believe. And then uh, one thing that I see that city, if you think of cities, they are quite, at least in Finland, they are used to gathering a lot of data, holding a lot of data about, about us and, and the citizens and using it. But I think the cities will also, when, when the My Data approach advances, they will start also being a data uh, consumer. So uh, we, we can start using your Netflix history while we are recommending you some reading, for example, in the library. If, if the person so <laughs> wishes. So uh, that kind of development to kind of change a bit, like do I really have all, does the city have all the relevant data or can they actually ask the citizen to uh, give consent to other data sources and kind of change their role in the, in the data ecosystem also into a data consumer. So this, these are some of the topics I see that are, are coming and, and taking place currently.
Yeah, um, we have one question on, on some aspects that you mentioned before we go to you, Martin. Um, maybe also um, Neil has one question that um, the data that you just mentioned uh, on consumer behavior, um, is that de-identified or basically anonymized? Do you know about that? Uh, well, in, in the cases I was uh, explaining, it's your own data. So you just get better tools and visualizations and, and other kind of analysis of your own, of the data that already exists about you. And it's for you to see it. But of course, I hope that in the in the long run, uh, for example, like we've seen with air quality data, we can start uh, utilizing uh, citizens as, as data sources and, and then they can uh, help the city to understand the air quality situation better. So maybe in the long run, we can have this data altruism also about our mobility data or, or about our energy consumption data. And we can all contribute Uh, in a way or another, through our data and through our behavior to the climate targets that, that the cities, for example, have. I don't know if this answered the question, but the whole idea is that the citizens stay in control of, uh, of who they want to utilize their data on and, and uh, who not. So the concept management is the key there. Yeah. Um, that's indeed the case. I think um, as long as you agree to your data being used in a certain um, way or for a certain service, that's the key point here indeed. Um, Martin, uh, maybe also asking the question to you. So how do you see the role of, of personal data now already in the cities, but also in the near future? Well, first of all, it's it's been used for centuries. So these are new ways of using personal data. And, and um, I think it has gone from being a clear resource in opportunity that we saw, you know, when, when like from the retail sector, we all know what Amazon is doing with data and, and so on. And I think actually it's turned into a problem rather that needs to be managed. So um, it's a little bit like wastewater management or, you know, when, when the rain pours, you actually want to have separate flows for the dirty water that comes from, you know, the sky and from water that is managed uh, from other sources. And it's the same kind of thinking. And, and we have not in the infrastructure that the digital society so far, so far has built, been built upon, we've not had this built in you know, controls. And I, I see my data as, as an expression of the need to get this. So on the other hand, there is a, there's a huge opportunity, obviously. I mean, we can mine, we can target, we can be proactive and so on. But I think the focus right now isn't actually on just building, you could say, the business cases and, and so on, but rather to understand how the heck do we govern this? How do we govern? But then how do we underpin those governance uh, requirements we have with technology? And, and how do we do that on a societal scale? And societal is really, I mean, in the EU, you have the, the, the digital single market. And, you know, we're all using global platforms, whether they are, you know, from East or West or wherever they are. So I think there's a huge opportunity, but the focus right now is actually on mitigation to, to ensure that it doesn't go completely haywire. Um, so I see the, the, the top line for me is, yes, we have crisis, yes, Personal data can help in, you know, solving whatever health or, or environmental or whatever. But, but actually, we, we, have, we don't have simple answers. We have dilemmas we need to figure out. So this is where I see the point right now. Personal data involves a set of dilemmas that we need both to discuss politically and have a language to discuss. So that it's not just, you know, binary, this or that. And then we need the underpinnings, which I see happening here. So for, for me, it's actually, it's, it's crisis management and it, it's, it's risk management, essential. Yeah, um, I think you mentioned already a couple of, um, yeah, we have mentioned opportunities, but we also now have, you know, mentioned barriers, dilemmas, risks that are associated with, with using, or, or as you say, we've been using uh, personal data studies um, for forever, basically, but now we're using it in a different way, uh, so to speak. Um, maybe a, a question to Mieke. Um, how is it in, in a municipality like Eindhoven? How are you perceiving um, these dilemmas? How are you dealing with potential dilemmas uh, when talking about the personal data of cities? Citizens? Yes. 
we are uh, uh, doing and trying and showing because the, the language uh, that we have to learn and to speak with each other, uh, that's so difficult to, to deal with so that we are in uh, a way of working that we have is we do in a, in a, in a small scale, we show, then we can talk about it, then we have the same language and we can uh, see what's happening in a real world. Because for personal data, we have in the Netherlands, uh, the IRMA app, uh, for example, that started to develop in the Gemeente Nijmegen, municipality of Nijmegen. And there, you in the app, you have the uh, your uh, ID that you check in for yourself and you have to make connection with the, the database of the government, then you have a, a, a fixed, and then you can go uh, do your communication with only public partners. And that's a very small step forward that the, uh, the citizens have their own uh, ownership of their data. And they can combine with the municipalities uh, where are the data used? Wherefore are the data used? And is it right? And uh, you can ask them, uh, please for, for, uh, forget me. Now, that's not for every example uh, uh, to fix because I have to pay taxes. So uh, they will never forget uh, to forget me uh, what, uh, what I am, who I am uh, and what I have to pay. So that's, that's a, a first step. But a lot of uh, municipal uh, citizens don't realize what they are doing. Uh, the example what Martin al already uh, said, I share my data with uh, several apps and then I don't read any, um, uh, how do you call them? Any regulation, I said, okay, I share everything. But when you have a service of the municipality or the government, then you are totally, no, 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 I don't want to share nothing because nah, that's, that's the, the way of talking that we have to discuss with each other. Why are you giving to the, to the big uh, uh, companies like Facebook and Google all your data? And to the government, it's so difficult to share your data with. So that's the discussion that we are trying to open up. And it's also a political uh, one. So um, yeah, it's hard work with, uh, with, a, with a group of uh, politici, citizens, uh, colleagues of mine, experts, uh, dummies, uh, a whole group. So we don't know the answers yet. We are only... Uh, <laughs> trying, testing, working, and doing. Thanks, Nika. Before we pick up some questions uh, from the chat, maybe, Martin, I think we mentioned the dilemma now <laughs> that we're seeing. Um, how do you see this? Um, what's, what's your point of view on that point? I think the first thing I see is that it cre it, it, it's super expensive. There's a reason why you don't just build these platforms and why the venture capital or other capital is really where the action is. It costs shitloads of money to develop these things. And clearly, and that would be the position of OASC, you know, one country or one municipality should not <laughs> invent this. I mean, how could you? So I, I think actually you mentioned taxes, uh, uh, Mike. I think we need to understand just like, you know, there's property tax, there is wastewater tax, right? Because you need to be able to fund the, the, the you know, the, the proper operation of these resources, the data is a resource. So I think we need to find out where to get the money. <laughs> and, and one thing um, is, and I know this very concretely because I mean, we're, we're all working on how to make this practical. And one thing I think is a good example now is, you know, the, the new EU in this case budget um, was approved last night, right? So including the recovery and resilience facility, and that's 750 billion, 20% is actually set aside for digital, 37 to green. So I think it's that kind of investments that nobody has a sort of a, a, a short term business case for, but we need the investment. I mean, it's like, you know, Elon Musk's uh, rockets or Uber, I mean, it'll not turn profitable in a in a millennium, but it's 
it's an investment. Um, and some can see a benefit from doing. So we need to come together as many communities, many municipalities and countries, of course, and fund that. that there's, it's the only way. Otherwise, we will have crap sewers. And, and I think what will drive this forward is crisis. Just like the COVID now has driven a lot forward because we are dying. And I think we, this will not be high on the political agenda unless, unless we have, you know, things going really wrong. Uh, that, unless that will not, so the climate urgency, the, the Greta Thunberg, you know, voice needs to be there as well. Otherwise, it'll not move. Uh, can I continue? <laughs> please, please go ahead, Anna. Yeah. So fully, fully agree that some like a lot of collaboration is needed for for the infrastructure and of course like sharing the costs and 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 contributing to that together. Uh, but why I think that it is very good that there are these local experiments is that at least during the last years of, of, of my data, uh, global and all the activities around it, one thing had, has come quite clear for me that in Finland, for example, cities are seen, if you think of like who should be the my data operator, for example, that the cities and, and public sector in Finland are, are seen as very, very likely uh, players in that field because there's this very uh, shared, I mean, people trust Uh, the public sector and state and, and, and the city is quite quite uh, well. But then you can go, you don't have to, I mean, even within Europe, there's very different. Uh, some people, like mentioned, trust the companies almost better uh, to handle their data than, than the, the public players. So I think that's why it's very important that there are these uh, iterative and, and, uh, and uh, co-creative processes going on all over the world uh, around this topic so that we can kind of understand people's uh, kind of thinking, motivation, attitudes towards the, the whole, whole idea. And, uh, and, and also like how, how to, because the TK has been working a long time with digital skills. And I think here's one topic where we need a whole new set of skills, like how do I manage my data? And what, what does, what, 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 how do I as individual act in this data economy? Uh, but before you get to developing skills, you need to have people to have the motivation. Like, I mean, and there are these kind of, of course, crises or situations where data is mishandled. They, they are, of course, one way to create the motivation, but I hope that we can also communicate all these benefits that, Uh, the consent management and, and the my data approach can bring to us as citizens and and as consumers and individuals that uh, then we have the motivation to learn about these things there yeah i think you're mentioning some some very important points hannah um on the one hand and i apologize for the questions that are in the chat i'm not forgetting about them but uh, we'll get back to them a bit later um You mentioned that, uh, you know, consent base and we need to bring the skills also to the people and motivate them to actually give their consent and, and, and actively say yes or no to certain services. But um, I think in Finland and the Nordics especially, um, there, there is a different approach, as you say, towards the public authorities, right? There's a lot of trust towards public authorities. If you go further down the south, um, that's not the case anymore. I think... Um, Many in, in Italy, for example, there's a different uh, yeah, attitude towards uh, local authorities. Um, but even within um, countries or, you know, where, where the trust is high, how should a city or a local authority in general work towards you know, getting everyone on board? Is that, um, I mean, we, we're talking about empowering citizens with their own data, right? But what if, you know, just being devil's advocate, what if city, citizens don't really care about that? You know, constant fatigue, yeah, yeah, sure, just, just take it. Or say, no, I'm not giving anything to the state. Um, how do we tackle this? Maybe I'll give it just back to, to you, Hannah, and then we, we see how, how Eindhoven deals with this. Well, I, I, in a way, I think maybe one way is that we should just be stricter about under which terms you can use people's data so that then it would require more active <laughs> decision making uh, but I would maybe go back to working long time with open data and how to get cities to open up data uh, even though it's kind of I mean this is about consent not about opening your data but uh, one key thing was this reference application so that when you open your data in this format you oh wow you get a nice visualization or so so maybe one way it's, it's it is a bit of a chicken <laughs> egg problem but if you don't have the infrastructure that Martin explained of course 
you, you don't uh, develop so scalable services, but at least to have some, some use cases where you actually, it delivers you benefit, you, you get better service, you, you get something out of it yourself as a citizen. And there, there you build, build the motivation. Of course, you need maybe more, more solutions also for managing data that not everything would require that click, that you would set certain boundaries that what, where can the system click yes for you, which not, but uh, that's a whole and another level of the infrastructure and discussion, I guess. Nikki, how do you see this from a, from a city perspective? Yes, I will uh, um, give an example because we, we tested the, the EMA app for our ID. And especially the youth, when they go to the, the pubs on the Stratum Seins, then they have to come in and to uh, show them their ID cards. And what, what are they doing? They are giving the ID card to other people. The ID with the IMA, IMA app, we, we put it on the phone and they, the youth is not uh, willing to share their phone to another. So about uh, sharing your data with your ID ca card or an app on your mobile phone, then the mobile phone is a lot safer for the youth than the ID card. So that's also uh, an example how we uh, tell the, the youth how they have to go and to uh, protect their ID and their own data. Uh, and this, th these are lots of examples that we are uh, testing with students and to give them um, lessons learned how we have to do it. Because we don't know, uh, really not uh, how we uh, can explain and, and, and tell and show, yeah, we do it, but we don't know what's the impact. So, yeah, we, we are trying and we are testing. That's that's one uh, uh, one part of it. And now with COVID, uh, what you also see is when you go to a restaurant or whatever place uh, we uh, still able to go to, that you have to uh, write down who you are, what your uh, email, your phone number, and also with the Irma app, you have a part of it that you can. Um, facilitate as a host you you get your own qr code and when you have visitors then they uh, make a picture with their camera from the mobile phone of the qr code and their data is uh, uh, written down on that day, on that time, when the 14 days are passed by and it's not necessary to have the data anymore, then they uh, throw it away automatically. When you have to need it because you have uh, an illness or something else, then you can open the box and then you can inform the people who has uh, visited you. Now that's, that's a very small building block uh, that, um, uh, very fast uh, win the, the 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 usability of it because the the open books was, are laying on the tables. Yeah, everyone said, "Oh no, that's not feeling well." So this will help. Um, yeah, to to know what are we doing with the data, but these examples and telling about these examples, yeah, must help. Um, to realize what we are doing with our data and how we work with data. Yeah, I think you mentioned a couple of things already also um, that are linked to a question that we have in the chat. Uh, you mentioned that you work with students, for example, to test. Um, yeah. And one question from Anoop was, are there citizens involved in the design of the services themselves? And if yes, how do you do it? Do you have any advice to share on, on, on that aspect? I know that also Eindhoven is very strong on the living lab approach side, so maybe you can share a couple of tips and tricks. Yeah, we, we have a lot of students who, uh, who want to do uh, projects uh, with the municipality more than we can uh, give a place. So we also said to them, um, uh, try to um, make your own uh, project uh, uh, topic. And, uh, and um, 
make a good uh, trying uh, which problem you want to uh, to solve so that they are uh, have their own idea what they want to do the goals that they want to reach so you have the energize of the 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 group themselves what they want to do and when we are saying oh you have to do uh, this way or that way yeah wait we want to use their uh, their ideas how crazy sometimes uh, also but we learn uh, from that and i don't think so that it's uh, a golden tip or something else which we want to cooperate with them. And what we also trying is when uh, one group of students have closed their part of uh, problem solving, then uh, we try to let them uh, make more or less a question for the next group so that we have a, a continuing uh, um, flow of students who are uh, doing topics for us. Thanks, Mika. Um, I, I know, sorry for, you know, digging a bit on this. You mentioned students quite um, quite often. How are you also trying to to involve other citizen groups, for example, elderly or, you know, the the moms uh, or, or uh, you know, different, yeah. different groups? Yeah, we, ha we have uh, 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 just uh, because of COVID uh, and um, uh, colleagues who are looking for new tools for participation. Uh, because that's now difficult. We had a lot of physical uh, meetings for our uh, citizens and uh, 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 employees, uh, etc. And now the, the physical um, meetings are not possible anymore. We have to deal with uh, the digital tools. And now we are um, looking we have to do that and we miss a lot of uh, participation uh, because uh, a lot of people are not uh, digital uh, skilled or well skilled how do you call that uh, well well known with the digital tools or they don't have a good device or so that's that's for us now struggling that we are not um, serve the whole group of participation that we want to reach normally yeah. Uh, do we have any other comments? Hannah, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just, uh, well, from my previous work in Forum Virium, the city of Helsinki's innovation company, we run quite a bit of, I mean, I think you can do co-creation uh, on a different stages, of course, of the project. So in some ways we, we explored the attitudes more through workshops and questionnaires, like how, how people, what's their attitude in general about using their personal data, what kind of services they would envision. Uh, we had quite concrete examples of real-time oh. energy consumption data, for example, uh, in, in certain newer buildings in, in the smart city district and had a company to create visualization because the data, the, the data was there, but it was not really in a, uh, served to the, 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 <laughs> the inhabitants or the, the people living in, the, in those apartments in, in so usable form. So we kind of made a visualizations of it and organized questions around it. And I'm sure there's even more activities going there now regarding this same topic of mobility uh, behavior and and so forth. But I think it's it's like, I mean, there's so many parts of this whole, uh, I mean, what kind of services people envision or how they would like their concept management to work or what's their general attitude or what kind of skills they feel they need. So there's a lot of uh, co-creation to be uh, uh, run in the My Data topic. Thanks, Anna. Um, Martin, do you have any, any additions to, to that topic before we move on to the next question? Well, I come to think about how we, we um, learn to use the mobile phone. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, it turns out so that I have a background in also the interaction technology side there. And it was interesting to see, so, so in those countries where, where children, for instance, were taking up the mobile technologies uh, at the earliest age, which was Denmark and Japan, basically, um, uh, there it was. It was really interesting to sorry Denmark and, and Korea. Um, it was really interesting to see a lot of gender differences. So, in all age groups, the early adopters, like 
who really understood how to use the services were women. And there is a very good body of research that if you design for women, you get a better transfer effect than if you design for men and boys the other way. I just cannot help think of that, Leah, when you ask about different age groups. I, I think there's also, we, we have to recognize that, um, um, it, first of all, it takes time. It, it took, you know, two decades more or less for the mobile phone. And, and we have how, how long now, five years or something like that, maybe 10, but five years in, in understanding what we can do with these technologies we're talking about. But so it will take more time. But also, I think that um, we probably don't know yet what will be the drivers. So Mika and Hannah, you both talk about, so what are the concerns that people have and so on? And basically, I would, I would bet less on, you know, I, I would look a lot about how the social interaction functions. And, and it is very much driven. I, I'm sorry to, to say it, it's not... It's not the same. It, it's it's the early adoption and the the robust and long term um, stability of of those uses tend to come first with the female part of the population. Just a thought. Yeah. When uh, may I react? Uh, because uh, the technology is not a problem. I think uh, the devices is not a problem. But when we uh, just like now we are talking to each other, it's a record. Uh, what do we do with the data? Uh, what do you do with this uh, uh, copied part? That are the questions that our uh, personal of uh, privacy officer are uh, asking. And when we, as a government, uh, we are a trusted part. So uh, they said more or less, oh, no, 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 no. We are not using that, uh, that tool because we don't know uh, if the people who are uh, have an in-log, uh, if they are really the people who they said they are. So it's not to trust. So we are not able to use that. So that's more or less the difficulties where we are uh, handling now. Yeah, I think we're sort of, sec where, you know, we're actually already in the debate already, but um, also in the chat, I see, you know, the question about how can we advance the skills? Well, how do we create digital literacy, right? Um, first of all, I would like to ask Hannah, what do you think are the skills that we need both on the citizen side, but also on the administration side to, to, to sort of, you know, take the next step um, it's, it's a tricky one, I admit, but... Uh. Uh, it's a vast range and I guess depends on in what, what kind of role, role you are operating. But I think for citizens, even outside personal data, the data literacy skills, uh, data rights uh, related skills uh, are, are quite becoming more, I mean, uh, more and more into a bigger role because... Uh, we are so much uh, produced uh, visualizations and so forth. And, and when we start having this more like algorithmic decision making and so forth, there's, there's so many levels of the, of the, uh, the visualization, what's all relies behind the visualizations that we are looking or the, the uh, suggestions we are getting. So there's a lot of, a lot of skills behind there. And I'm not saying that every, everybody should be an AI or data expert, but just it also it, it becomes a usability question and like how do we make these still easy to use, convenient, but somehow like a trackable or traceable and transparent these systems. So um, yeah, that, that kind of skills, I think then from the, the, if you look at from the public sector side, I think in general, like data awareness, like the, seeing data as a, as a resource and, and being able to choose what, what data is relevant for which operations and how, how you can use data to improve, improve your operations and, and make them uh, better fit the, the needs of the citizens and, and the city. And then there you have, I mean, as a manager, you, you use it for different, uh, I mean, you need to be a kind of promoter of this approach and you need to understand the bigger picture. And then you come down to start talking about the infrastructure and and your service design and 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 I mean the, every role almost has a bit different kind of needs around regarding data. 
so not very good <laughs> maybe answer but but yeah there's the no but I, I think that's that's the reality right that we're, we're looking at um, everyone has different needs and, and we sort of need to get there I think the question is how do we get there <laughs> do you think it's it's a it's just an incremental approach or, or how can you know how can we shape this together this knowledge or, or what are the tools that we can use uh, well, like mentioned, DIEC has a long history on digital skills and, and we've been creating the what's now known as the kind of European uh, computer driver's license. So kind of from very basic basic skills to then do the skills that infra people need when they are working in this uh, data, uh, well, I mean, uh, information society kind of uh, like searching for, for information, managing uh, information and so forth. Uh, I think what we see, I mean, in general as a trend to, to, to enhance Enhancing digital skills, it becomes more and more these nano skills. I mean, nano uh, courses and training. I mean, you just while you're working or studying, you you in the meanwhile always learn little pieces of of the big picture. So you not don't necessarily anymore go through a whole uh, run through an examination of of something, but you you uh, gain gain uh, skills while working and then make those skills visible. Uh, through, through uh, different mechanisms, like like this uh, open batches kind of approach, for example. Uh, Mika, how, how do you see that so in terms of what skills are needed, maybe also from a direct experience from within the administration? Uh, that would be interesting to hear as well. Yeah. <laughs> If you can share. <laughs> yes, I can share because there was a, a publication just yesterday that in the Brainport uh, 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 region and Eindhoven is the best part of the uh, innovation lab or uh, AI and uh, that kind of stuff. And I, I am really, what I did is I shared the post to my colleagues in the municipality and I said, so... The region is ready and now we as municipality has to deal with it. So it was an open uh, invite, so let's work in it. So what we know is that the, the, uh, the people who are uh, well-educated, well-known, uh, very good with, uh, with learning and doing, uh, are in the outside and not in the inside. So the, the cooperation between in our ecosystem system is so necessary uh, that we can um, make good uh, working spaces. So we have to cooperate with each other. Just there, everyone has uh, to train, to learn, but not everyone um, uh, has to learn that because we have also other parts of uh, working uh, stuff that uh, must be done. So I think that is, that's uh, more or less that we uh, must know that we are working in multidisciplinary teams, uh, that we can cooperate with each other. And yeah, I think that we uh, we have to go uh, that uh, yeah, that part. Uh, um, um, we must know how we can work together on that uh, on that topic uh, and trust each other for the cooperation. Yeah, maybe um, the handing directly to Jim Martin. Uh, what's your point of view? Well, I I'm a paid educator, so um, we've been working a lot with computational thinking and how to get that into elementary schools and even before and and you know all the the formal education. So I think basically there's there's a, a long-term track and there's a short-term track and everything in between, of course. And back to your point, um, um, Hannah, before that, I mean, the long-term, sure, we should learn more about it and in two generations, things will be different. But what can we do here now? I think there has to be a common ground also in all of these interventions. And um, of course, awareness generally, I mean, how do you use social media? So there's there's a digital literacy which can be addressed but i think also like with you know innovation projects and, and organizations learning how to use these technologies like you said miki right now i mean just understanding what can we do now i think it would be helpful to have more common ground also in these micro or nano interventions so that that we build up a pool of of confidence but also understanding of you know, how to navigate these dilemmas, not just in principle and using all the big commercial things or whatever is locally available, but also on a more broader 
cultural side. And I think initiatives, I mean, conversations like this, my data and the related uh, initiatives could serve as input also to these micro, nano, short-term uh, interventions because there's so much out there. So, so yes, yeah, short-term, long-term, broad, but actually also something very concrete. So things we can actually do and, and, and not just talk about. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, sure. Um, Hannah, and then we go to Neil, uh, just in, uh, getting some participants also on, on the stage. But Hannah, go first and then we go to Neil. Uh, just that very good point from Martin on the common ground, and I, I feel a bit shamed that I didn't actually bring bring that up <laughs> because uh, in in Finland, for example, we've been try working on this uh, national digital competence levels and and kind of defining like what are those <laughs> uh, skills you need, and then I mean then you have a kind of a goal that this is where we're aiming, and then you can you know do those little pieces. Like now I, you know, this is my focus for me or our organization, and that's what we map for. But unfortunately, they are not on the, on the, the so focused on data. So they are just the first the basic digital uh, skill or data, uh, digital literacy uh, uh, def definitions for those levels. But next up is the da data literacy and data rights management literacy. Uh, yeah, wow. thanks, thanks, Hannah. And I invited Neil to to also speak up because I, I saw that there is um, some very good comments also made in the chats, and I don't want them to get lost. Um, and I think also Neil, I, I read that you were tuning in from Canada, um, so maybe you could briefly introduce what you're doing and also share your your take on on that um, with us. Yeah, it, it's a great conversation. Um, uh, just to give some background, um, I'm a high tech guy. I'm involved heavily in. OAuth and OIDDC uh, integration for customers, including a uh, company in Sweden, uh, do completely remotely. Um, but I'm also heavily involved in the tech community here. Plus, I am a community association president for our local community. So I get, you know, I get to see the users. And, and certainly an observation I would make is um, to get anybody in the community interested in something. As someone, I mean, there's a whole bunch of community associations that are constantly growing and dying. It's, it's always a hard thing This is pure volunteer. Um, how do I start a community association? Really simple, have a major crisis. Um, and, and that's true. So, so here it would be, you know, somebody's trying to drop a 50 story tower next door to, uh, uh, in, the, in the middle of the community and suddenly you've got thousands of people who you couldn't get their attention uh, the week before. Um, and, and it tends to be, uh, and the model we have used, which is, uh, I, which has been somewhat unique, is that gives you an opportunity to educate people. So if they want to fight that 50-story building landing in their ne neighborhood, they need to understand how the city does their planning process. And I'm heavily involved with our, our city uh, uh, in that regard here, so I'm, I'm wearing about three or four hats. Um, and and the, the one thing I would observe is, is that there, there is a spectrum of trust from people who hey, it's free, I don't care, use my data, I don't want to understand. Uh, certainly, uh, Martin's observation that boys just don't care. <laughs> Women are far more socially attuned to the impact of, of what they do than, than, than boys are. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, that's a problem. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, if somebody wants a service, and, and what I have seen, certainly, certainly the United States is a massive issue, that the, the, the the, the temperature difference between Canada and the U.S. in terms of trust, uh, Canadians will yell and scream about government, but they trust them. And they tend to be much more, um, well, let's put it this way, COVID is an exact example. The, the infection and death rate here per capita in Canada, despite the fact that we're next door and people leak across the physical border, which is enormous, uh, is, is about a fifth of what it is in the United States because people here generally are more compliant. Now, they're a lot less compliant than other places in the world. Um, in the US, there's just absolute hostility to uh, sharing anything or trusting anybody. And I think they have a major problem. And you know, it's only when, and, and the observation down there is, but there is implicit trust in certain things. Um, so digital driver's license, not a lot of resistance to it. Hey, I got a license from the government, so if it's digital, I don't care. Not understanding that, okay, now you're getting into trusting governments around digital identity. So there's this very schizophrenic public out there, and that's going to be really tough to to get through uh, in in you know 
in Canada and the U.S. and whatever else. It's, I think this is a long path here uh, to education. Uh, part of its motivation. Um, if someone's a, if you told somebody, hey, to get this free thing, you really need to understand this. You know, some people will take the effort to do so um, uh, and, and become educated. Um, and people are generally happier once they're educated and understand how to play the game. But getting them from, I don't care, I don't want to know, I just want to stop or get this thing to being educated is, it's hard. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Neil. And I, I think what you mentioned with the schizophrenia is, is sort of a good point that we that we need to take into account, all of us. Um, and I, I also noticed that Scylla turned on her video. And um, I, I, I know that you have a, a bit of an Estonian background. And I'm, you know, everyone in Europe looks to Estonia because, you know, there's a lot of trust and things just go well and everything is, you know, digital. Even me as a German could open up a business in Estonia without ever going there. Um, maybe you could share some experience of how, how it works in Estonia. Is it just a cultural thing or, or how do you see it? Thank you. I'm sorry for putting you on a spot. <laughs> no worries. Um, there is, of course, the, the level of trust that has been also grown into into the society by using the, the digital technologies uh, for the whole e-governance uh, part in, in Estonia already for for yeah decades. Um, so um, so that kind of makes people used to the to the technology and, and they basically just continue uh, using the services and knowing how to do it. I'm personally skeptical about how much people think about those while they're using those uh, because that also comes to the point of uh, like actually taking the time and um, and uh, yeah trying to understand how the the data economy data uh, ecosystem works and and people don't have the time nor the interest for for that uh, if they're not specifically interested in in those things so all of the previous discussion about uh, crisis uniting things or or a problem or something that that happens to my community and then activates me that kind of puts people to to take the step uh, like back uh, look at the situation and then uh, start uh, also raising their uh, skills for example so that's like one of the the layers of uh, what i've constantly thinking how much people actually uh, think about those as well because there's this notion of of trust that they're also like not uh, we need trust, but uh, too much trust is also not good. Uh, so <laughs> we need to be also having that critical view on, on how things are, are managed. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Um, does someone from uh, our, let's call it main <laughs> roundtable participants, Mike, Martin, Hannah, do you want to jump in on, on what has been said? I, I have one thought, and, and you know, there's this joke um, when it comes to managing your own data about cutting out the middleman and and there's this this kid on the side of the road selling you know information about what he did i mean today i clicked twice on something today i passed so i mean actually we don't want to manage our own data right i mean it's it's, it's not our job like i don't you know check the traffic outside it's it's sure i care <laughs> I don't check the, the wastewater if it's, you know, up to snuff, unless there's pollution that I think the government isn't taking care of. So I, I think there's a very, very big uh, conversation about the role of local authority. And, and Neil, I think your point is, is very valid, that this varies wildly, and you said it also, so Leah, in the beginning, this varies wildly from territory to territory. So I think we, we have to find ways where we can locally, you know, do what's in line with what is, you know, historically, culturally, legally, you know, in place. But then there still has to be a common ground so that technically we can, you know, exchange. But then you just know that in this territory, this is what, you know, you can rely on. Um, so there has to be some kind of expectation management uh, as, as you go up the stack or complexity. But at the low level, there should be, you know, you, you should be able to audit systems and they should be able to tell you what can you expect from them. And then, you know, you could have my data operators or others that then check if that is true. So 
I, I think we need to build these layers in between, you know, us as individuals and consumers. I don't like to see us as mainly consumers, but many of the systems do. So I, I think, you know, b- between the state level and the personal level, there has to be something inside. And I think that's one of the reasons why we in OAC really focus on this, you know, the, the, the lower level um, towards the, the digital society. So I, I think Miki and, and, and Hannah, you, you have, you know, the prime perspective in understanding the complexities there because how much do you want to fit in there and how much is in common? Because even I think Eindhoven and Helsinki are quite different. Yeah, I guess I've really been uh, happy to follow a bit, not of course any more so close by, but the the, the Finnish uh, Ministry of Finance funded uh, this uh, City My Data Operator project, and now it's it's processing. Maybe there's somebody in the room here who who knows even more uh, up to date details about it. But it's the largest cities uh, joint forces to to kind of find ways to. Uh, Identity management, permission management, uh, service management, data models, uh, uh, personal data transfers, and and so forth. So I think like so it's good to see that there are this kind of maybe, maybe this is the regional level in that sense. Like what what's the between the state and and the cities? There's some kind of common ground then then there tech those technology wise as well. But a lot, lot of work, of course, remains to be still done done around this. Mm-hmm. Another thing, I don't know how many of you watch that social dilemma, which I mean, of all of us who work with te- technology, of course, no. But it's also kind of for us a ch- challenge that how do we do this content management or data operators or, or I mean, how do we build this infrastructure so that it actually... Uh, serves the people and doesn't just hook them into managing their data or I mean somehow that it's it's convenient and and usable. Yeah, um, Mika, you unmuted yourself. Do you want to? Yes, I was sorry. Yeah, because this uh, this conversation uh, gives me the the, the insight that we uh, uh, also uh, have to manage our risk that to manage your own data is a very difficult uh, topic. And uh, when you are not good in finance, you give it uh, in a service to an employee who is uh, doing your finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's waiting for the people who are saying, oh, is it difficult that you manage your own data? I can serve it for you. Mm -hmm. And then you pay someone to manage your data with all the risk and difficulties uh, behind that. So uh, I didn't re- recognize m- uh, myself uh, before this conversation, but this one topic that we must be aware that we have to uh, give the, the, the common ground that uh, Martin uh, mentions that everyone must uh, can do it by themselves and that we have to service that they can uh, still doing it by themselves. So that was the the... the the thoughts that I, uh, I, uh, what opened my eyes. So it's very difficult uh, when we have to manage that. Yeah, indeed. And um, maybe, um, Neil, uh, let's take your question and then uh, we, we jump into a different uh, sort of debate. But uh, you go first. Uh, certainly one thing uh, I'm increasingly observing here in, in, in Canada is that, uh, and there's been a lot of conversations in this and other meetings, is a needing for a digital advocate, a digital identity advocate, someone who is acting as a technical and legal expert on privacy. And certainly My Data Canada, which I'm part of, uh, that's a big topic. Um, and, oh, hey, we could have an AI do that. No, it, right now it's, it's a moving too fast. It needs to be a digital service where I go to somebody who can e- either advise me on how to manage my own data or someone I trust to do so. And it has all the aspects of both the technical expertise and a, a legal certifiable uh, uh, person who is, you know, got a certain level of standards, just like, you know, you do you, you do a, a, an employment contract or any sort of contract, you go to a lawyer to get them to do that. And I think right now that's the reality uh, is that it, it is beyond the education ability uh, of, 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 the, of the public to manage their own data right now, anyway. Yeah, thanks for sharing also that view. Um, I, I think uh, definitely you, you, you have your point there. 
Um, I collect now some, uh, we, we close now a bit the, the data literacy part, um, because I also promised in the description that we go a bit technical as well, um, but only a bit. Uh, so <laughs> we, we heard from Eindhoven, they're working on the citizen cards. Um, I mean, the Finnish cities overall, of course, are, um, you know, pioneering in, in, in building proactive services for cities. And these are all examples that could be used in different, you know, local authorities, uh, local authorities, um, or could be provided by a region as a, you know, white label tool for cities to use and 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 to to go on. Um, there's also this aspect of um, what happens if I, as a citizen, go abroad. How can I use the services that are, you know, going on there that are offered there? How can I be part of this? Um, and I, I think uh, we should also talk a bit what Martin said before about what are the technical underpinnings maybe that allow for cities and, and local authorities to reuse um, operational solutions that are already there, for example, like citizen card. Um, maybe Martin, could you share your view on this a bit? Um, well, um, we don't want to start from scratch and nobody wants to build this alone, but then again, you don't want it completely top down as, as you all said, also pointed out, Hanna, it needs to be top up, right? So with, with some, you know, different ideas and, and dynamics and then, well, actually putting it together into something that works. So I, I, what we're doing, maybe just as an example, um, so OASC is developing minimal interoperability mechanisms and not by, you know, taking them out of thin air, but in this case, uh, the MIM on personal data management is combining my data and, and this vision with the solid initiative of Tim Berners-Lee and colleagues and the IHAN, this idea of not having an international bank account number, but an international humans account number. So your handle or whatever. So, so bringing these together and then express the, the, the common capabilities actually that any system should be able to express so that you can audit, so that you can, you know, actually also port data with the context without violating all the consent um, graphs and, and trails that are there. So I, I think building on what is there, but not, you know, picking one winner, but, but really understanding how do we have a forum for shaping this. So, so for me, increasingly, the, the, the main investment is in, in, you know, building concrete fora where this is discussed, just as like, like this, occasion here um, because we need and, and Neil thanks for your your comment about you know yes we need you know advocates and lawyers and, and so on but we also need you know the laws <laughs> so and and, and there, there's a governance track like we talked about for and there's a technical one and and they need to inform each other so it becomes a virtuous circle so what I'm seeing now is that that it's we're building on a high baseline actually and then that is maturing into something robust that can go into policy, that can go into, you know, requirements for, you know, the operators. I saw another very interesting um, comment in, in the chat. We can maybe come back to that around the real estate. So I, that's what I would say, build on a, on a, you know, multiple baseline and then make that, you know, into what, what is actually in common. And, and let's, let's implement that iteratively so that we don't, you know, throw all our eggs in, in one basket. Hannah, you unmuted yourself, I saw. Do you want to uh, jump in on that? Or uh, I've been a big uh, interoperability advocate for what, <laughs> 10 years now. So I think this is very key key thing for this to fly in the, in the long term. Uh, on, at the same time, I have to say that I think it's, it's maybe, I, th I like it that there's a lot of initiatives like this uh, skills uh, data space work. So kind of focusing on certain domain and, and bringing the players who, who would be data users, uh, data collectors and so forth and kind of have a real ecosystem where people, I mean, organizations and, and they really have a different kind of role in the, in the data ecosystem and then uh, use them as this kind of testing ground for while the specification is developing and making sure that, that uh, uh, because if you just uh, build interoperability for some closed system where there are just two players, it's not really bringing the benefit. So you should have a uh, an ecosystem where there are multiple uh, data users, for example, that actually directly benefit from the fact that uh, the, the, the interoperability and the, the common ground is there. So I think that's, that's something nice to see that these tracks are 
uh, going forward at the same time. Yes, indeed. Um, Mika, uh, maybe also in terms of the ecosystems that, that Hannah mentioned, you also have uh, launched now or you are about to launch uh, a new initiative um, that sort of goes into, you know, in, in the same direction. Maybe you want to explain a bit how that also relates? Yes, it's, uh, it is. And we mentioned it at Urban uh, Development uh, Initiative. Uh, as uh, the city of Eindhoven and also Helmond, the, uh, are scaling up as a municipality. We uh, have to build a lot of houses. And when you build uh, houses, then you have uh, uh, green spots. Uh, you want to uh, still drive with your car to the city. Uh, now, everything uh, what we have to do, but that all the things that we uh, want to combine is not possible. So we are looking for our smart urban planning tool. And what we uh, are building there is the national digital twinning uh, uh, proposition where we mentioned of mentions that we realized that uh, national is not enough. It must scalable to international. So we are uh, cooperation uh, with a uh, lot of partners, OWASC also, but uh, lots of cities, uh, developers now. We bring them together to, to cooperate with each other to come to the best uh, products on a program sc scale in the UD. And as a city, then you have your small projects, showcases, so that you can uh, try out in your own uh, municipality and that you can scale up to other cities. So that's the, the initiative that we have started uh, now with uh, also the, the university, uh, high educated schools, the, the citizens are uh, involved and uh, the, yeah, lots of business uh, partners. So that's uh, one part we, where we uh, want to learn from each other, uh, develop and scale up. So yeah, that's what we are uh, trying to uh, yeah, start with uh, 21. Yeah, that's uh, quite exciting as well. And I, I mean, we're having a really big discussion at the moment, uh, jumping from skills to technical. So it's we can see that for, for cities, local authorities, um, using, sharing and, and managing uh, personal data in this new way uh, to get new benefits for both uh, local authority, but also for citizens is, is really um, quite, you know, a lot of work. And um, I mean, thanks, first of all, for all your comments. And I, I saw of, I have to say, I lost a bit track of what's happening in the chat because there is a lot happening in the chat. But I would like to take a couple of questions from there. And please uh, do, I, I apologize for not picking um, everything, but I want to scroll a bit back because there was a, um, a quite interesting question by uh, Francesca. Um, she actually had one question and that goes also to, to all of the panelists. Um, how do you think that local authorities can manage the conflict between the rights of individuals to privacy, to data privacy, um, in contrast to creating these new value-added proactive services. So I think it's a quite interesting question. Um, does anyone want to take that up? So data privacy versus proactive better services. Yeah, in the in the UDI and our development, we have uh, 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 plans and uh, and uh, glass and house and uh, and house of glass, so that we uh, put it in the in the middle of the city to be transparent. What we are doing, where we are data collecting, so that they can see what we are doing, and also uh, more or less with a, a, a joystick that they can change. The, the things for themselves and uh, we will do that because we are branding uh, for design technology and knowledge uh, in the brainport uh, region and you until now you don't see it in the outside it's only a name in branding because of our companies so we want to sh make showcases in our city so that we can um, make yeah have some interest also in the living labs that we have more uh, traffic with uh, with our citizens but also our tourists so that they uh, know what we are doing 
uh, in the city and the city center. So that's that's one idea we have uh, and that we are going to uh, to exploitate. Yeah. So basically, you're counting on on just raising the awareness of what's happening. Uh, in, in yes. Of- yes. From the the innovation methods, uh, doing, showing, and then scaling. All right. Um, do we have other takes on on that question? Data privacy versus better services, or you know, the more practice. Biggest approach sounds sounds like the the way to way to go about it. Uh, I think uh, the the. Chief Digital Officer of the City of Helsinki, Mikko Rusama, who might be maybe or has spoken already in this event, I'm not sure, but he often uh, was, I mean, it's not a solution to this, but he just raised this question that if you see a person collapsed on, on the street and, and you see that they're almost dying, that of course you don't ask that, can I help you? I, you can directly start doing everything you can to save their life, but currently with even if you, their data would show that there's a person under risk of, of some serious health issues, you, you, it's not so straightforward that you could start providing them help if they don't give you consent to first make such analysis on them. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to, I mean, I don't know what, where will the boundaries be. And, and, and I mean, it, it will be an ethical question also, because uh, of course there could be cases where it's not here. Saving lives sounds like something that, of course, you should give access to all kind of data, but you can have other kind of cases where it's not necessarily so uh, mm. uh, for the common good, so to speak. So I think we will continue like through these co-creational experimentations. And of course, the law will catch up. I mean, there, there will there's a lot of regulation that will have to take place and guidelines. So uh, I think it will slowly mature in a way that, that then allows cities to bring that benefit for the citizens. Yeah, and I think so. It's we, we um, it's one of the classical dilemmas uh, that we talked about before: surveillance versus uh, overview, and it's very context dependent. So the problem is that we don't have a good understanding of data in a context. Um, we know very well a person on the street. We can we can analyze the context immediately, but data in a context, the situation, with the, the idea of a situation. We don't have so well developed, and my data is going towards that. But I think so. So what you talk about is is also very much uh, Mika transparency. I think there are two other principles that really need to be understood well. One is the principle of symmetry, so that we won't we don't have asymmetrical systems, but actually anybody, given the context, can do something. It's a little bit like when you have an emergency vehicle going through the streets the law that governs that is the same as if you as a personal citizen just decide that this is an emergency and you act like one. You can. So I think to to ensure trust in the system is that actually anybody can under exceptional circumstances, you know, decide that, that something needs to be done. So this the the, 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 sy- the symmetry in the systems, I mean they are entrenched through centuries in law, but they are not in um, the digital systems, which shows the immaturity, you say, Hannah. And the last thing is just history. Remember the history of, of you know, these situations and what, don't, don't forget how we usually treat, you know, um, um, situations because the law will catch up, but I think the law actually is there, <laughs> more or less. We just need the technology to catch up with people so so i think it's really on the technology side as saskia Sassen says to you know to to civilize or to to humanize technology i think that's that's what needs to happen that is almost a nice uh, phrase to end the discussion with <laughs> um i'm actually wondering do we have any more questions from the audience uh, or any other comments um because we're slowly but steadily coming to the end so officially we have 10 more minutes so i i definitely would like to open the floor maybe still um i can't scroll through everything but if you want to take the mic <laughs> feel free to jump in yeah um i, I was just uh, to repeat my comment there it was one of the, the earlier sessions that were, it was also the the dilemma between kind of uh, whether to what is the um, um the data protection um uh, restrict uh new innovation and and uh, to uh, really like 
uh, develop services that would empower people. Um, and I think that that's the point. Uh, the answer there was that like, it's not an either or, but both and uh, type uh, approach. At the same time, I think there's also an intuitive kind of uh, um, um, reason to think that, okay, because we don't want these harms or these risks to realize, we will already close down and we don't innovate. And uh, in order to actually feel confident to do it and uh, and uh, yeah, continue, uh, you need to have a lot of know-how on all different kind of levels, both in the in the citizen sites as well as in the administration, in the ecosystem as a whole, and also like the culture to test, to pilot, to um, to reflect back and learn from it, and not be feel that you're right away um, accused for it, and because. What I've constantly thought throughout the session is also that uh, I think some, uh, some, uh, someone from you also mentioned about the kind of politics of, of this and uh, the, the having a political will to, uh, to um, develop these things is the, the question of there's always a lot of challenges and a lot of developments where to invest and, and this digital way is, is just one of them. Um, and and therefore you need to kind of really have this right balance, like uh, how much and how fast you you grow. And I, it's, I don't know, it's not a very uh, it's 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 a little bit half baked idea. But what I had in mind is uh, some of the the metaphors about being too busy uh, to hop on a bike to to then go faster. I think perhaps sometimes in cities it's the same thing that you're you're too busy solving some of the the current challenges with the current means rather than taking the time. Uh, to step back and invest into the new things in order to then solve them and go faster even. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it, it's really complex. It's really multi-layered and needs uh, development and uh, all sides, but, but yeah. <laughs> I think to the complexity of the issue, I think, Miki, you know exactly how it goes, right? <laughs> all right. Um, do we have... Uh, more comments on our questions from the audience um, before. I know that I didn't take everything up from uh, the chat. So sorry for just seeing popping up stuff from Martin. Martin, do you want to chip in? Actually, I think the, the, the question, I don't remember who, who put it, but about real estate. I think, I think the built environment is a very interesting place right now. So we talk a lot about digital twins and we talk a lot, a lot about, you know, the difference between buildings in operation. I mean, it's, it's really operational, right? It, it's not like, you know, just playing around. <clears throat> and then you have this more innovation. We build glass houses and we do things. But I, I think actually the built environment, our, you know, our dwelling places, they are quite interesting points to, to look at. We had here in ours where I live, the first smart building that was built in new development <clears throat> was a dorm for engineering students because then they just put a lot of sensors in and thought, oh, great, we, they don't mind. Um, but it took like, you know, two days before you've, they found out the kind of patterns you can recognize from just, you know, who, who's in a room doing what, just following, you know, the oxygen levels and so on. So I, I think the built environment and the real estate, because back to your point, Mieke, you know, it's economy, it's, it's tax, it's, it's, you know, really knowing what is where and who owns it, who's liable, who can be taxed and so on. I think the, the whole, I mean, real estate is essentially what has been driving the smart cities um, faces as, as I see it. So, so I think, I, I don't remember the, the exact question there, but I think that's a really interesting conversation and one where we can be very concrete, not just talking about online platforms, but really, you know, where we live. Um, like, you know, is my trash can, you know, empty? Well, my house is more li likely to be empty and be robbed or, you know, broken into. So I, th I think the built environment and real estate are really interesting um, domains to, to be looking at, to be honest, because it's, it's at the intersection of what is difficult to understand the digital and things we understand really well, our homes. If I can continue a bit from that, I think uh, that's actually very true to my my point as well. Like Silla was saying, that sometimes we are we are too busy to jump on the bike or horse. 
that uh, it was kind of the same when you start talking about open data in cities or getting API, open APIs or interoperable APIs. It was always something kind of they had the existing complexity and then you put something on the outskirts to just get something out <laughs> or them, some data flowing. And I've seen at least a lot of, and I think it's coming from this digital twin and the demand for like master data and, and kind of going, do an inventory of what do we actually as a city have and do we have duplicate, are we collecting the same data twice and so forth. And while this is now ongoing, I think it's very good moment for cities to kind of hop or, or make, make also the transition to this more consent based uh, and more interoperable uh, way of, uh, of handling data. So uh, I think it's it's just like like mentioned there that it's uh, and, and like you said it's the 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 kind of the low role of geo data and all these things and mapping and being able to connect what data links to what and link data we are, we are kind of handling a lot of stuff but hopefully at the same time so we don't have to first do a little fix and then realize like ah oh, we should have taken care of the consent management here also or like permission maybe not just consent but per permission is this internal data I mean the all the categories of data and understanding data as a resource better. Yes. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, Nike? Yeah, what we are uh, uh, asking for ourselves also is when we uh, having the, the digital twin eh, based on all the data and we are shaping uh, the city for next year, who will be the elderman of the digital twin? Now, that's, that's a question I said, oh, I am. I like to, but it's it's rare to to think about the digital model and the the, the real city in the day uh, uh, of today and tomorrow. So the, the two worlds, how do we uh, connect to the to each other? So that's uh, a question that we uh, have uh, marked also for our program. All right, thank you all uh, so much. I, I think it was a great discussion that we had. Um, it's now, we are almost reached the top of uh, our one and a half hours, basically. Um, I just wanted to thank all of uh, the panelists uh, for being here today. I think it was really a pleasure to, to talk with you. And um, also thanks, Sille, thanks, Neil, for you know active discussions and participating, jumping in. Um, also, uh, yeah, basically, thank you for the active you know conversations in the chat. I think this is a topic that um, is. I, I, I just love how the community here is is just you know engaging with with everyone. So it's it's really a pleasure to be to be part and, and to be here um, with the My Data community. And um, yes, as Temo basically also said in the in the chat, um, we are continuously having discussions around what does my data, what does personal data mean for cities, and how can we work on the tech uh, side to to make things happen, to make things interoperable, to share data with trust, um, to share it um, in an ethic and fair manner. Um, and uh, thanks, Rick. I don't have to do anything. So um, we will follow up on this topic in basically a month from now and uh, at the City by City Festival, which is the annual um, event of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Network. And Rick uh, did put in the link uh, to the overview and the announcement. And um, I hope to see some of you there. It's uh, The event is free to attend. Uh, we're traveling all our network all around the world um, in the third week of January from the 13th to the 14th. And um, yes, also to highlight, share your takeaways um, afterwards. And I think with that, I would leave you to go and have your well-deserved break <laughs> and dinner or, you know, wherever you are, maybe it's breakfast, but uh, it was a pleasure to see so many of you, uh, so many of you here today. So thanks for joining us.